could you go there? Hi all, um, welcome back to our Data Science Learning Community Book Club for Mastering Shiny. Today, we will talk about chapter four in which the author Hadley Wickham wisely produced a case study to kind of give us a overview of the workflow for making a Shiny app and reviewing what we have covered in the previous three chapters. So as you can see our objectives in front of us, including how to create a more complex Shiny app, how to build your app based on your data exploration, how to create your app step-by-step step, and, and to get more comfortable using the techniques so far. At the top of the page, you can see that our case study is about injuries and visits to the emergency room, ER. And for example, did you know that about 130 people per year in the United States visited the ER because of waffle irons? Good to know. This chapter is about building a more complex app using the tools we learned in previous chapters. I uh, just want to give a quick shout out to the packages. We're going to use the Shiny package, of course. The Vroom package was used along the way to load the tab separated values files, it's TSV files, and folks like me like to use it to tidy first. The data we're using today comes from the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System. And I believe it's um, shortened to NICE, which covers accidents reported from a sample of hospitals in the United States. Otherwise, this data set would be quite sizable. But just for the sake of today's practice, we'll deal with this relatively small sample. The data set is available from the GitHub repository for from the textbook. <clears throat> For every accident, uh, the variables include date, age, sex, race, body part, diagnosis, and location of the accident where it took place, as well as what we're going to call a primary product. That is, we're going to look at each type of injury in particular, and that's going to be a data product for our purposes. And we're also going to have a column, which is a brief story about how the accident occurred. The author included code to load up the data from the GitHub repository. So we can see that injuries is a table that looks like this. We could see that the products is a tibble that looks like this. That is, there's a product code, which may help us in the long run with some of the computer programming, but then there's the actual human description as well. <clears throat> and then later on, we're gonna to want to do a per capita calculation. So the data set also includes a convenient population uh, census data from the United States. So what we're going to do next, like in any data science uh, workflow, is probably do a little bit of exploratory data analysis, kind of get a sense of what we're getting into first. And you know what? Let's look at toilet data. Why not toilets? Could look through the products and realize that the code for toilet was 649, so we could use our deep prior skills to subset the data as such. And we find out we have nearly 3,000 records of people who visited the hospital because of toilet-related injuries. Now we could go through that subset and see that where this took place can vary. We could go through that subset of toilet injuries 
and see which body part was affected for each case. And maybe one more time, we could go through that subset of toilet injury history and get a sense of the medical diagnosis that followed. At this point, you might be curious about this weight column in the, in the data. And it turns out in this particular data set about injuries and elsewhere, the statistician might be concerned about if the data set represents the entire population, in this case, the population of the United States. For instance, if you're living in, in a dense city, you might have more injuries related to car traffic. But if you're living out on the edges of the cities, you might have more injuries based on construction. And these data that were brought together might not be completely representative of the whole country. So the statisticians gave some weights that would we be able to allow an analyst like us to rescale the counts to perhaps better represent the entire population. Now that concept, in case anybody's curious, I left a couple of links in the slides and I believe this is called propensity weighting. As a random uh, aside, I almost never use the count function when I'm doing basically a group by and a sum. <laughs> I typically just do the group by and sum. I mean, I, I know it's out there in the count to if you want to simplify, but um, I don't do it. Probably should do it more. Yeah, I agree with you on uh, kind of either way. Like we teach our students the count function, but whether or not they remember to use it, it's kind of up in the air. Now, as well as elsewhere in data science and, and reporting your results to people, chances are you're not gonna actually read a list of numbers to them. If you could graph the data and try to start to tell a story, your presentation will be more effective. So we'll build a line plot to, in this case, get it, the number of accidents for across age, ages and uh, across the sexes. And here's an example of injuries uh, thereof. In a bit of foreshadowing, the author actually merged the toilet injury subset with the overall population data, so that way we could do a per capita calculation. So you can see on the vertical axis, this is actually injuries per 1,000 people uh, based on toilet injuries. And we could see that this apparently affects elderly people more than younger people. This particular data set stops at around age 79. And that's simply because that's where the data had at the moment. From there, we remember that there are actually many different sources of injuries. So we could make a similar line plot for each one of those injuries. At first, the ggplot scale is facet wrap, and we could start to uh, build an examination like this, but then you quickly realize it's so crowded that it's barely readable whatsoever. And thus reading off the bottom of the slide here, the goal is to build an app which outputs the tables and the plot for different products and 
allows the user to select what they want to see. Uh, for the folks in the audience, how are we doing? Any uh, questions or discussion so far? No, I'm just thinking about your point about the facet wrap being crowded. And, and yeah, I mean, I think the, the problem is a lot of that stuff's pretty close to the origin, right? So you can't really tell if there are many ups and downs for, for some of those categories at such a small scale. I guess one thing you could do is let the uh, the uh, y-axis uh, float right so that you're you're not committed to just showing the origin um but if you do that of course then you kind of get an amplified sense of what's going on right so so th th there's a good and a bad to that you can see the ups and downs but it's it's magnified so uh, but yeah i agree with kind of how it's displayed it's only for a couple of those categories can you can you really see a a, a true trend yes indeed Okay, so from here, I thought I'd challenge myself and, and see if I could actually do this uh, with somewhat live coding. So here I opened up an R Studio session or two, and we'll actually run through the material this way. For a Shiny app, once again, we need a section for the user interface UI and the server code to run in the background. I'm going to be using the Shiny package, going to be using the Tidyverse. Now, for my own self, I loaded the data locally. That way, every single time I run the app, I'm not going to be pinging Hadley's GitHub repository. Yeah, and actually, the link in, in the book is not current from what I remember. I think I had to play with it to get it to work. Mm -hmm. I, I think yeah. it was the difference of, of the URL. It said like main in the book, but it's really master, or I might have that backwards. It might be the other other way, but um, yeah, the, the URL as stated in the book was not um, current. So admittedly, I'm gonna just copy and paste the code from the textbook. We have our user interface code and you can see we're gonna use the fluid page and fluid row uh, helper functions along the way. We'll literally see how this looks in the app in just a second, but let me also get the server code going here. Just for the sake of the Zoom call, I'm going to have a copy of the server code on the right as well. So remember, part of what we need to keep in mind in our programming is making sure that the variable labels are the same where we need them to be. And see if I remember how to zoom annotate. For example, when we talk about the injury types, which is called the code in, in the data set, we have the code here, and that means we could bring it back up here, for example. We're gonna to want to have a table of diagnoses. That's gonna be here in the table output. And that's created here in the render table um, function. Remember, it's not enough just to show the table. Later on, when we want to worry about interactivity and reactivity, we need to use the functions that will reload themselves as such. And one of those helper functions was render table. So similarly, we're going to want to have a plot
we're going to actually want to draw those line plots. And we need to bring in the plot output. Notice that the ID is age sex here. So in the render plot, we need to make sure that our output structure also has the age sex label. Otherwise, most of the code we saw on the slides before, admittedly going through the slides fairly quickly. Let me go ahead and click the run app button to see what we have at the moment. At the top left, we have our list of injuries, the, the code, so to speak. What this app is doing so far is the left table, all the various diagnoses that resulted from said injury. The middle table, all the body parts were affected by the injuries. And the right table, all the locations of the patient where the injury took place in, in their lives. You might notice on the very bottom right, the graph did show up. The issue is that the tables are so big and so informative that the user would have to scroll down to see the graph every single time. And at some point, there's so much information that is, it is more informative than convenient. So there are a few different things that we could do to arguably improve this app. I'm going to take another pause here. Folks in the audience, how are we doing? I'm tracking. Yeah, me too. I guess one so, thing maybe we could talk about, I'm just noticing this now. We went through the chapter kind of quickly, but if we look at the... Um, the server function for age sex, we have the render plot. And yeah, and then we're defining this variable, I guess, EXPR ex expression. I'm just trying to think through, out, you know, out loud here. Did, did we have to define a variable to make this thing work in, in the way that we're doing it there? You know, I, I see we have multiple lines of information where we're kind of taking our data source and then making a plot out of it. But is that, it, you know, anytime you're doing a render plot, is that kind of, yeah, I see. So to normally... partially answer that question, um, maybe it's just part of like the R programmers um, habits just to make sure every single thing in that particular part of code uh, falls within this first parameter of the render plot function. Yeah. Probably doesn't have to be called EXPR or something like that, but like Python with self or whatever, <laughs> just people, <laughs> people use it. It's just the, just the, the norm uh, that folks follow. Okay. But, I guess I haven't done enough render plots to know, but it, but it seems like, yeah, you would normally encapsulate all of that in an object like they're doing here. Yeah, um, it's, it's good to bring up. I'm not sure if it affects reactivity or anything. And of course, the way our functions tend to work in general is that they return the last object that is calculated. Yep. It's just the syntax is a little bit different, right? Than a typical like R, R function, how, the, how this works. It's like the, the argument itself that EXPR is uh, multi-line, which is, is just interesting, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what we're gonna do next, folks, is to polish the tables try to improve the app, and we'll go through this in a step-by-step -step manner. As we saw, the prototype of the app had very long tables. You know what? Why don't we just show the top five? Fortunately, 
of folks in the R programming universe have a package called four cats, four categorical variables. There's a couple of functions that the also use uh, pretty quickly here. Uh, these are rather new to me, but let me just try to explain it really quickly. One of these functions takes the categories with the smallest counts and groups them together into a category called other. And one of them uh, takes does something similar, but in this case shows the top five categories. And then from there, uh, groups the rest into a, a category called other. So we'll talk about the injuries in general. Uh, we could see that we could have our top five here, and then beyond that, what uh, factor lumping will do is just literally grab everything else and put it into this one last label called other. If anybody's curious later, there's a exercise here that follows up and there's a answer as well. So perhaps it's easiest to see what we're trying to get at at first is now we could get a, a place where the tables show the top five and then at the bottom of each table have the lump together other counts as well. Because we're doing this with diagnoses, body parts, and locations, the author follows his own advice and oh, did I switch these? And writes a function that will handle this for us called count top default setting counting the top five, but we could also customize this number here. To be able to later let the user choose, or not, sorry, not the user, to let the programmer choose which variable we're applying this count top function to, we do some more abstract programming using this curly brace from the RLang package. Depending on the audience, this might be some relatively new programming. So if there are any questions or whatnot, uh, feel free to ask. Yeah, no, no questions for me, but I mean, I, I, it's obviously like pretty, pretty neat um, uh, design uh, choice here, right? To, to not be uh, repetitive with, with the code. And so that's a pretty uh, flexible dynamic function. Indeed. So what we're doing for this particular app on the right side of the screen, we're going to affect the diagnosis table, affect the body part table, and affect the location table. But because the deep fire stuff with mutate, group, and summarize are performed by our helper function now, it actually condenses our code as such. And now we have our output tables looking like this using the count top function. Just some good ideas while programming and thinking about things in a module way that will hopefully cut down on debugging later. Later in the book, we'll of course have a chapter or so about best practices. Yeah, just, just uh, a little comment about that. Um, I think the, the, the main idea of how best practices are being implemented in, uh, uh, in any programming language is how to abstract um, the concepts or the logic away um, and try to encapsulate it in somewhere else and reuse it whenever you need it. Um, so you, th this, this practice is uh, is exists in every programming language, and we see here in R, and we see we'll see it. Uh, we could see it also in Python or any other programming language. 
uh, now in R in, in Shiny itself, it's it has this kind of modular uh, like mechanism that uh, we will discuss in chapter. Uh, I don't think I don't remember its, its number, but uh, later in the book we'll discuss the modules and how we could use modules in Shiny. Uh, since this is not built in the R language itself, so they have to give um, uh, to, to to create this kind of mechanism to make it modular as possible. Uh, they they did the same with PyShiny as uh, at the same time. Um, uh, so it's the same flavor. If you know the modular uh, modules uh, in R Shiny, will know it in uh, PyShiny. So it's uh, so it, this this I just say that uh, the Python way of doing things mm -hmm. it's already have this modular built in in the language itself, but in R is this is not the case. So um, they have to to do it by themselves. Uh, yeah, that's that's just a little comment about uh, modularity. Yes, thank you. I I agree with you that a lot of us R programmers these days use R Markdown or Quarto, and we follow the notion of chunking our code which if you read something like the programmer's brain, you realize the value of that. One of the annoyances of programming in Shiny, at least in the early years, was having these huge um, code blocks where it would be difficult at times to track down errors, especially if just missing a comma or parenthesis. For the app itself, I'm just double checking the interactivity by playing around with the products, the, the injury codes. And you could somewhat see that the line graphs change, the counts in the tables change, and so do their arrangements because they're always ranked from biggest to smallest. But once again, what we did was make sure that the tables are fixed with the top five, so six rows really. So that way it doesn't take up more visual space and that way we could have room for the graph itself. Now on the graph, the vertical, as we discussed a few minutes ago when it came with the facet grid, part of the issue with the data set is that some injuries are simply much more frequent than others. And that might make it mentally tough to consider um, how to compare them if you need to compare them. So some folks want a normalized or in some sense of a, a per capita, I, I keep saying per capita, it's not really a spatial argument, but a normalized uh, way of going th through these numbers. Now, uh, depending on the story you're trying to tell with the injury data, you might want the, the raw counts and you might want the normalized rescaled data. And we realized quickly well, with the ability of the Shiny app, why don't we just simply give the user the ability to make that choice for themselves rather than we telling them? So we're going to move on and bring that functionality to them. What we're going to do at first is you see in the top left of the app, we have this choice of the product codes. We're going to also try to give them another pull down menu. We're going to have, happen to call it Y in the textbook code here. See if I could just load this up right now. And now we have a pull down menu that could display the rates and, or the counts. Now at the moment, nothing's happening because I didn't affect the server. We want this to be done in the in the plots. So we have now two versions of the plot. Let me do this on the right here. We now have two versions of the plot. If the user wants the raw counts, we uh, give them as such. 
if the users want the rates, then we could bring that up as well. I'm just trying to remember where the rates were. I mean, the rates were here on the left, and that's the rate that's referred to here. So these are the entry counts divided by the number of people at that age group, and then we scale to make the numbers nicer. I'm sorry, did I interrupt someone? No, no, I, um, I, I was just uh, like, I noticed that main, the main reason we are like building shiny apps is that to, to have this, this, to create this mindset of um, make the people serve themselves uh, as a way of designing the app itself to be interactive. So the change of change a slider or uh, have this uh, drop down or click a button or something like that. So we we have this. We we are like we we should always think of, of it as um, we are building a product that will be used for uh, other people to explore the data itself, not just uh, showing the result ourselves, but we make them discover discover the uh, or explore the the data is the, the data by themselves so i think this is very important to 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 know that or to notice that this this kind of mindset of when we're designing the prototypes of apps of shiny apps in general so when you design a prototype you, ha you should have like what you want the user to interact with what the output of this interaction should be look look like and something like that so yeah, that's just a little notice that I, uh, yeah. Yes, indeed, I agree with you mm -hmm. thank you. Oh, let me run the app. <laughs> so now on the select input pull down menu, uh, now you can see that we could look at the per one ten, per 10,000 count of people if desired. Notice that at, for what I'm doing with the pull down menu, this does not change the tables and we could draw the reactivity tree and think about that later if we wanted to. Looking at the top left in the injuries data frame, you might notice on the right side, there are uh, sentences. There are quick descriptions from the nurses or whoever uh, filled out the data for the patient that tells a little bit about, about the patient more than just the overall category of the injuries. And if you're presenting something to make kind of an emotional case or you're making some sort of story map or thereof, you might want to bring this information in to literally bring a human element into this de description. So we could try to show a little bit of that narrative as well. Copy and pasting the code to the server, or sorry, to the user interface we're going to add an action button that says, tell me a story. Now I'm going to get an error because when I made more to the layout, I forgot that there was a comma after each one of these elements. So I need to make sure that's a comma here. And to be honest, that's one of the most frustrating parts about this shiny program. So what we're doing is adding this tell me a story button to the bottom right, which at midway at the moment doesn't do anything. But we want this to 
activate something whenever we click this and we have some space below the graph to do some more descriptions. Thus on the server end, we could create the, the elements that we need for the narrative. We have an event reactive. We briefly talked about expressions. Uh, this will also have a value. This is curious. It's just taking our subset of data. We're going to pull uh, that last column from the data frame. And we're using the pull function to kind of like unname or to turn the this back down to an atomic vector. And for now, we're just going to talk about one story at a time, selected at random other ones. Because it's a text, we use our render text function, bring this back into the output structure as a narrative. And then finally have our text output here where the narrative is. So now on the bottom of the app, we could click this action button. It'll refresh the string and it will tell us a quick story about one of the patients. Now for this book club, I have about five more minutes of materials, but at the moment, do folks have any questions or discussion? Um, not really a, a question, but maybe we can just explore in that narrative sample uh, object that we're creating, you know, under that event reactive umbrella. There's the event expression, it, it takes a list as an input. So that's that was a little curious. Uh, I, I was a little, you know, I haven't really done a deep dive into this. So let's maybe just explore what that's doing. So it's it's taking the filtered data frame, right? Uh, which is the selected element. And then the input story, that's the action button itself, right? Isn't that we're calling that story? Yes. Okay. So I that with you. it's good to connect all this. Yeah. Again, it's just it's a little interesting to me. So I guess in another situation, we might have more elements that would be feeding this than just the two here. Right. It, it, it's all about um because this is a react you have to this is an event reactive, so that you know you're doing something and then Shiny's um doing something as a result of your action and and so, you know, in a realistic scenario, you could have more than just the two we have here um, that would be involved. But um, again, this was just interesting to me because we're we're including all of this stuff under um, within a list um, as as part of that argument. So, if I may in, indulge the group a bit, there were some end of chapter exercises and. Folks in previous cohorts kind of discussed like, from here, how can we make the app better if we wanted to? So I just kind of played around with it for a few more minutes. Hopefully this will all run. And I got this version of the app now. So one thing, uh, I, like to work with grammar or tables, GT tables, and that is a possibility when making tables thereof. All you have to do on the other side and the in the server side is instead of render tables, you render GT. 
Now, the choice for top five was rather arbitrary. As one of the examples suggested or exercises, we could change that and allow for longer tables just in case the doctor or whoever needs more information. Oops. Kind of made my computer mad there. So in order to do that, in the user interface, we could apply a slider input. I went from one to 20, had a default value of five and so forth. Inside the server, I kept track of the number of products. In my naive coding, I just made sure it was in a reactive environment. And in the count top helper function, we now have a reactive variable with the parentheses. Finally, um, with the plot, in addition to kind of modernizing a bit, if the user later on wants to say, save the image, I wanted the plot to actually tell us, well, what was the name of the injury? So if you notice that the subtitle on the GG plot will now change to express that as well. So in the output, in the ggplot subtitle, I wanted a product name to be a reactive variable. So then I went back and made that reactive here. So that's some of the ideas that we could choose. And if future co cohorts want to expand upon that, that would be great. Yeah, pretty nice. At this moment, I believe our facilitator had some to talk about Python. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think um, I should I we could pass that for today's session because I have some technical difficulties. I didn't like make it uh run for some reason. I did check it before the session and it, it was working, but now like my computer is making me crazy. So, um. I will make it like for the next session at the beginning. I think I am. I will be the the presenter. I I think if they, uh, I would check up the the sign up. But yeah, we could more discuss more about this chapter. So, um, what do you think about like um? Uh, could you like open the, the same uh the, the the modified version of your app again? Here we are. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I I know that the uh, the great table packages already exist or is existed for a long time and it's pretty helpful and uh pretty easy to use. Um. But what if like we want like um to sort based on the the numbers? So I think it's uh it's more convenient to me to to use like. The data table, I think it's called data table. I didn't like, I don't remember it that much, but it's called the data table where we, if we press the call name, it will be, it will be sorted automatically. Um, and that will be helpful for folks that have um, this kind of way of using Excel or any type of uh, analytics tools that to sort stuff on the fly. Uh, same as for BI or so or some analytics tool on other analytics tools. Um, so yeah, and inter interactivity. I think more about the data table have also this kind of selection. So we could select rows from the table, and based on this, those rows, do some analytics and make more, make the application more engaging. Uh, for example, in the diagonal, if you want the, the puncture or other or not stated those only, uh, so we could select them and based on them filter filter the um, uh, the graph again uh, based on the selection or the clicks uh, that that the user do. Um, so yeah, it's it's a pretty pretty interesting idea. So 
to explore if, if you want to like make it more interactive more more like a product uh than just an application now this this is very this is already very like interactive by its own way so it's it's already very good um but yeah this so the more we dive into this kind of ui uh interaction inputs or outputs uh, I, um, components the more we will will find the way to like uh um describe the interactions that we want in head in head that's why I, I was talking about before before about the, the prototyping mindset where we should um design the, the application uh in the paper like the, the, the author already said that the, the he already like do this kind of uh designing the app in the paper uh, in a paper and then also do this kind of um, draw the drawings of the, of the the what's called yeah reactive graph uh, of the app, which is very helpful if you want like see the dependencies of elements or components on each other, and at the same time when you are writing the code you already know what is links to what, and the full map is already on your mind so you could easily just implement it or execute it. Um, yeah, that's, that's just a, like uh, a comment about designing mindsets, uh, for, for building shiny application. Uh, and because I, I worked with like a couple of clients that really do this, like they, they have this, they said to me, what, how, how I, I want to do something particular. So they requested a, a specific feature. So I said to them, like, to uh, try to draw it with just pen and paper and send it to me. Or we we could draw it together and explore it together. And then see what you want as an interaction or uh, how you interact with the data itself. Do you want, like, um, like a very fancy animation stuff or do you want, like, a very a pretty like interactive graphs for example we we didn't talk yet about the interactive graphs uh so this is a static static graph ggplot is, uh, is producing a static graph but i think you, you could use the plotly inside uh ggplot to to produce yeah, yeah uh, ggplotly use... and it, you'd have tooltips and, and stuff or you, you hover over the data points and get get more trade... information and annotations and like uh, creating like controlling the styling and the fonts, the colors, and all those so sort of stuff. I think that we will talk about this in later chapter. Uh, I didn't, I don't know if it's, if you really like go in deep on this, but I think this is very interesting for people that really want to advance their app, like make it better and prettier and more customized in their logos and. Uh, personalized as possible for their company and those stuff. So uh, we will like dive deeper deeper into the styling and how we could like, for example, here we are using the grid system, which is fluid pages that composed of uh, fluid rows and columns, which is a great, this is a particular grid system is built on Bootstrap and Bootstrap itself is a web technology and the web technology itself is um, is a CSS uh, framework. So if you already know the like the tree of technology that the dependencies of the technology, you already have like this mindset of how okay how I could like uh, change the CSS framework that already built for me, but I want to customize it more and more. So yeah, just just like. Uh, an explanation of ideas uh, of, uh, of of already like of building shiny apps. So, anyone have any other things to add? Uh, just to add a note about um, having a, a slightly more interactive graph. One idea I had at this moment is to say, for instance, at the bottom of the page, we're talking about a seventy-four-year-old person. I wanted to have a particular dot 
or GM label to point out that 74 year old on the graph. The issue is that as programmed, this action button for the narrative and the graph are in completely separate areas in the reactor tree. They do not affect each other. So as you were saying, when you're trying to um, plan out the whole project, you want to know everything you need to do in advance so that way you could backwards design everything you need to build along the way. At this point, someone would ask me to put this label on the graph itself, and I would be frustrated because I know I would need to overhaul most of the code. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And building this reactive dependencies is really like not that, not that easy. Like it's 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 not it's it just you are building the dependency that already dependent on something else. So you have to care. There is, you could, you could uh, go for like, like a trap of like uh, loop looping. So th this dependent on that, that thing as other thing is dependent on that thing. And it's looping to the dependencies and changes. Uh, it's like a, a looping, not never ending loop. Uh, so you have to be careful when you, when you're designing these graphs, these graphs, and it's also pretty helpful if you again the, that's just design it in your in a pen and paper, and then design the reactive graph and in a pen and paper, and what it, what should depend on what. This will give you a deep understanding of what you could do and what you will do. Again, and the same time you are designing what you already, what you want. So it's it's not just you have a building blocks and you're just using the builder blocks. No, it's you, 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 you like make your app based on what you have in mind. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks all. Aaron, anything else from you? No, I, I think this was a, a really nice uh, dialogue today. I appreciate the discussion. You go in the extra mile with, uh, you know, incorporating some features beyond what, what's uh, in the text there. Yeah, this is very really interesting, like, pretty cool, I think. And I think the, the, the more we did ex do exercises, 